Why are people who have had too much to drink, why are they inclined to make bad decisions? You got really quiet in here just right there. I just noticed. <laughs> is there, there is some kind of correlation between bad decision making and alcohol use. I mean, I, I don't know what it is. Well, I kind of do, I think. But I do know this. If, if someone is sober, you, you never hear them say after being sober, man, I wish I were drunk last night because I would have made a great decision. I mean, you don't ever hear that, ever, ever. But what is the correlation? Well, what do we know? We know that alcohol impairs the prefrontal corp cortex of the brain, so that's the part of the brain that controls judgment and decision-making to some level, and, and uh, it's also the part of your brain that doesn't work at its fullest capacity when it's you know, when you're, until you're about 20, 22, maybe for some of you 30, 40, I don't know, it depends on the person, but, but there is an age thing there too where it develops and then it's, you know, if you're 20 years old, you know, you may not be quite developed. So alcohol frees you to act freely in, at times when maybe you shouldn't, when maybe you should show some restraint. And alcohol also kind of governs, uh, excuse me, the prefrontal governs the your speech, which mine's not doing very well right now, I don't know what's going on with that, but, but, <laughs> but it governs that, and so therefore, if you impair that, it also makes you talk at times that maybe you shouldn't talk. Okay, it does that. Now, by the way, this isn't a sermon about alcohol, I just want you to know that, We're just, I'm just setting this up, but comedian Ron White, who's made a fortune making jokes about alcohol use, was once arrested for public drunkenness, and he said, I had the right to remain silent, I just didn't have the ability to remain silent. <laughs> and he's right. You know, so, you know, again, again, now this may not be your issue, or maybe, you know, long since you've worked through this, or maybe it is, I don't know. But, but this message is about the human inclination to make poor decisions when we don't listen to logic and to our conscience. That's what this message is about. And my point is that all people make irrational and sometimes damaging decisions. And if you're human, raise your hand. If you're human, raise your hand. You know that's true, okay? I just baited you into that. But we can get stupid. We can miss cues. Now, let me ask you this. Is it always easy to make good decisions, yes or no? No, it's very difficult because there's a sales rep in my head that's always trying to sell me something. And usually the something, or at least oftentimes the something is something that I, that I shouldn't really consider, but it looks good right now, you know? And then there's people in my life, you have them too, who might have competing agendas and so, you know, they're going to try to rope you into stuff because for whatever reason that gives them satisfaction or whatever. And you and I, we have past experiences that just influence our decision making. And, and sometimes we just make the same decisions over and over again because we can't break through that. Now, would you agree with this? It is a lot easier to make a good decision than it is to live with a bad one? What do you think? It's not easy, but it's a lot easier. We're in this series, Choose Your Own Adventure, and we're asking these questions. We asked the integrity question a couple of weeks ago. By the way, you can go back online if you, if you want to pull this series together and you didn't hear these messages. The integrity question is, am I being honest with myself? Really? I mean, the question is, if I look in the mirror, am I really telling myself the truth? And then last week, we looked at the legacy question, and that is, what will be my story? And at the end of days, we'll all have one. What are people going to say about us? What stories will they tell? And that's a daunting question, isn't it? Now, this third question that we need to ask is the conscience question. And I'm, I'm phrasing the conscience question this way. Will this decision made keep me up at night? Will it keep me up at night? And my challenge, my encouragement 
for you is, is to pay attention. As a matter of fact, I was looking at definitions for the conscience. What, what is conscience? And I came across this one, Shane Hatton, author and life coach. He calls the conscience the internal tension competing for my attention. I, I kind of like that. The tension that competes for my attention. So I have an option. Some things are in play. I'm getting nudged around. It could be my own conscience. It could be that people are saying things to me that have some impact on me. I mean, I may, it can be other, other things too. Maybe I just feel uncomfortable and I need to think about it. I don't know. It could be a lot of things. But as Proverbs 22, 3 says, a prudent person foresees danger and takes precautions. The simpleton goes on blindly and suffers the consequences. And that's really the theme of this whole series. So to foresee danger, we need to pay attention to what's creating tension in our lives. Now, some people just call that a red, red flag moment, which I think is, that's good. That's a good, think about it, red flag. You know, you're driving down the road and you see red flags. You're, you know, you're immediately cause, or you should. It should cause you to pause, get off your cell phone, look at what's going on, you know, do the things that, that, that will help you be safe in that situation because something doesn't feel right. Maybe someone asks you a question you didn't consider and it creates some hesitancy. Maybe what you're leaning toward looks good right now, but you're just, just, just doesn't sit right with you and you're not comfortable with it. Maybe you're feeling rushed and you're under the gun and, and you know, you got to make the decision right now, but you're, oh, this is a big decision. Maybe you've used this phrase about 100 times in your life, this looks too good to be true. Well, that's a, that's a red flag. At least look at it. Maybe you're starting to read the signs and, and, and you feel like if you do this, it's going to make you compromise something in your life that's important or valuable. And so it makes you pause. I don't know. It can be a lot of things. Tension. I mean, what will your wife, what will your husband, what will your children, what will your parents say if you take this route? I mean, it's worth asking. Tension. What will your boss think if you do this? I mean, if you consulted them first, if you put the idea out there in the small group, what's your small group going to say if you just throw that in the circle? Tension. Can I truly afford this? Tension. Does my contract allow for this? That's tension. If it comes to light, how, it's, how is it going to play with my reputation and with the reputation of my family? Tension. But we have a tendency, and we're good at this because we're human, to dodge the truth, and we use all kinds of excuses, and you've used them, so have I. Well, what does she know? She has a perfect marriage. If she lived in my shoes, she'd feel differently. Or what does he know? He's never run his own business. Or they're going to tell me I live my life? Have you seen how they're ruining their own life? I'm not going to listen to that. Or who cares what they think? This will make me happy, and that's what matters more than anything else, my happiness. Who cares? And we all do it, friends. You can look at me like, what's wrong with that guy? You know, if you're honest with yourself, that there's red flags, they're worth a pause, and the caution isn't so much what they're saying, it's rather what your conscience is saying. So allow it, at least pause. Allow it to bother you for a for a period of time to figure it out. So God's Word and the Holy Spirit provide the right kind of tension for a human being's heart. We've, we have these two things in play if we'll take advantage of them. There's an example in the Old Testament in the life of David that I think shows us a good example of what it takes to make good decisions in a, in a tough situation. And, and what happens here, and you'll see it, is he paid attention to the tension, to the inconvenient information. Okay, so let's get into this. Now, I'm going to set it up a little bit. I'm not going to read, I'd have to read chapters to tell you, for us to get to the point where that we're going to talk about. So let me just summarize this. David was a man who God had handpicked to become the king of the nation Israel. The problem was that there was currently a sitting king named Saul who had disobeyed God and displeased God, so God wanted to replace him. And so, and yeah, the time wasn't right. So David has this legendary 
uh, heroic moment, you know the story, you read it to your kids, where he, he slays a nine-foot giant named Goliath, the enemy of Israel. And so he immediately becomes a household name in Israel. His likes are soaring. I mean, everything's going great for him. Even King Saul liked David and brought him into his court. That is, until he realized that his popularity exceeded his. And then he became a threat. And so several chapters are written about how David was was pursued by Saul for the purpose of Saul taking him out. So he's a fugitive. But now David is a charismatic leader. He's a great leader. So people follow him. So he has his own little army. But the thing is, his army was fighting the battles for Saul and for his kingdom. And yet Saul saw him as, as a threat. So this is what happens. I'm going to read beginning with 1 Samuel 24, verse 1. So if you want to follow along. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, the enemy of Israel, Saul the, with his army, he was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. So as he's fighting these other enemies, Saul's always got David on his mind. Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats, a place I'd like to visit someday. I think that sounds pretty cool, the crags of the wild goats. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Yes, that's in the Bible. It's right there. I don't know what terms Pat would have used to describe that. I'm just going to use the biblical term, relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. And it does seem obvious. I mean, really, because he's supposed to be king. Saul is trying to kill him, so there's that going on. And it just seems like the right moment, the right time to to change everything. You know what? If he took Saul out, it, it would avoid civil war. Uh, the nation can go forward. So what happens next? Then David crept up unnoticed, probably with every intention to slit his throat, the Saul's throat, and, and instead he cuts off a corner of Saul's rope. So he sneaks up, cuts off part of his rope. Now why did he do that? Why didn't he just... I think there was a tension. I think there was a tension that, that got his attention... And yes, there's this opportunity, but the right thing to do, well, he didn't want to be kept up at night. He didn't want to have to live with this decision because this isn't war, this is murder. See, I think that got into him. Now, here's the problem that we face. We want to believe that we can control outcomes. We want to believe that we can make the future what we want it to be. And we all do this. I mean, did you hear about that guy who last week, he, he, he made a bet that uh, San Diego, the San Diego Chargers, he made the bet at halftime of their game. They were up 27 nothing. Did you hear about this? He made a $1.4 million bet that they would win the game, and uh, he would win 11000 bucks and change. And does anybody know what happened in that game against Jacksonville? And can you imagine what his conversation with his wife was that later that day? Uh, honey, how do you feel about working again? You know, I mean, it's just, that is not good. And, and you're like, well, last time I gambled is when I played bingo at Grandma's church, so this doesn't relate to me either. Friends, we gamble all the time. Just as maybe not with the million four that you have in your bank. Good, good for you. I mean, some of you are like, I don't know, all this work I'm doing, this is necessary now. I've got to grind now. If I'm working all this time, it's for the security of my family. And someday I'm going to make it up to my wife. I'm going to make it up to my spouse. I'm going to make it up to my kids. And that's a gamble. It is a gamble. Or you're like, well, I'll get back to church someday. I mean, you know, I, right now I have a lot of things to do, but someday I'm going to recover my spiritual wheels, you know, and Start getting on the right track. And you never do, because some days hard to come by. Well, I know he has a temper. 
Everybody knows he has a temper. But once we're married, oh, that's going to change. Mm-hmm. Weekend to remember, half off. <laughs> Keep working on it. You made the choice, okay? Maybe, maybe I'm being a little flirtatious because, you know, it just feels good that somebody notices me. Oh, it's just so nice. But, you know, it'll never lead to anything more. Well, my mom isn't thrilled about the guy, but who is she ever like that I brought home? She's your mom. She has instincts. At least have some tension there. Warning flags from your spouse, from your friends, from God's word, from your conscience. Now, it's not always rational. The tension doesn't always play out to be a negative, but it's worth it. It's worth it just to, because if you ignore the tension, it might set you up for greater regret later. I'm just saying that. So you allow whatever's bothering you to bother you so you can avoid future hurt. And friends, if you're like me, you probably are in this regard, there have been times when I've ignored the tension and I suffered huge consequences. Maybe it was something in my marriage. Maybe it was something with my kids that I just didn't deal with. I should have, but I didn't. I didn't want to create further challenges between them and me. Or maybe it's something at my workplace where it created greater consequences that, I, that led to regret, regret letter because I didn't, I didn't listen to the, the voice of God in my, in my heart. Let's get back to David here, verse 5 in chapter 24 of 1 Samuel. Afterward, David was conscious stricken for having cut off the corner of his robe. So he, had to, he was even guilty about that. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, and lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. In other words, say, hey, this is my king, and God's got this in, in his hands. I don't have to take matters into my own hands. And then he rebuked his men because they wanted to take matters into their own hands. I just think David looked at this and said, I don't want this to be my story. I don't want my story to the story that my grandkids tell about me is, oh yeah, my grandpa, he was the king. You know how he became the king? He snuck up behind the other king, the king before him, and he slit his throat. And now he's the king. I just think it came down to that. So look at what happens next. Saul leaves the cave. He returns to his waiting army. David comes out of the mouth of the cave and then he shouts at Saul and the, and the army. He says, my Lord, the king. And then he bows before him. And this is kind of amazing to me. I just, I just think, I see how David, you know, he, he was not a, he was not a, a dumb person. He, he understood leadership and he understood the things that people value too. And, and look at what happens he, he bows and he says to all who could hear him, may the Lord judge between you and me and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evil doers come evil deeds. So my hand will not touch you. Now think about the waiting armies, you know, David's men, Saul's army. Think about what they heard there. They, they heard a leader say, I will trust God in this matter. And it would help unite the kingdom later. And what did Saul hear? Well, see what Saul does here. I mean, Saul, it says he wept. He showed deep contrition. He acknowledged in the moment that eventually it would be David who would rule over Israel. He knew that. He knew the prophecies. So he made an oath with David at that point, and he said, would you just not hurt my descendants? Would you not kill them? He made a deal with David. And David did not play God, as you know. David did not take matters into his own hands, and things worked out the way that they needed to in the end. Now, one of the things that you see in this scenario is there's humility. And what happens is that Saul is humiliated by David's humility, not by his great leadership, not by him being a great warrior, but his humility. I mean, do you want to be the hero in your own story? You can be. But it will require at times for you to pay attention to the tension, 
because the decisions that I make every day make a difference that writes my legacy for the future. And dads, moms, grandparents, the decisions that we make daily are the ones that our legacies will be built on in the future for our kids, and it's going to change them too. And when you become a Christian, you made a commitment to live by the Word of God and to follow the voice of God, and that's important. And Jesus says this in John 16, 13. He promises believers, he says, that when he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. Now, we like to think that we know how things are going to work out, and then we make decisions accordingly. But there's the truth. The truth is that if there's a healthy conviction, a hesitation that comes from God, there's wisdom from God, then we need to give God time to instill that into us. Now, I don't know how this has worked for you over the course of your life. Like, I mean, I know some of you and how your lives have gone to some level, but I, I can't stand here and tell your stories because that's not fair to you. But I do know in my life, there have been several times when, when I actually did it, when I paused and I listened, it changed everything. Like, for instance, in 1979, it was when I made the decision to follow my calling to be a minister. And I had been living a very disobedient life as a 19-year-old young man in Omaha. I I had had another weekend of chasing the kind of stuff that many 19-year-old young men chase uh, in their lives, and I didn't like myself. I didn't like where it was going, and I'm sitting in a, on, a, on a patio in West Omaha at my apartment on 108th and Maple. It's storming like crazy, and I, I, I was just, I was pretty devastated, in, you know, just personally. And, and I listened. And in that silence, not audibly, but as clear as I could hear, and I can still hear it today, I believe God said to me, you're going to die. You're going to die this way. And that created a lot of tension in me. So I did what... Not a bad idea. It might be one of the best ideas I've ever had in my life. I went and dusted off my Bible that I got for graduation, and I opened the Bible, and I read from Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, and I let that bother me for what seemed like hours. I don't think it was, but it seemed like it. The Holy Spirit called me, and two weeks later, I'm in a car. I'm driving to a Bible college in Norfolk, Nebraska. Had no idea what I was doing, other than the fact that I let the tension bother me. Now, in 1980, when I was at that college, I had a relational decision to make. I was in a lobby at, a, at the dorm, and there was a young woman across the way, and she had the sweetest voice I'd ever heard and, and the most beautiful smile I'd ever seen. And as she talked to her friends, I'm thinking, she could complete me. And uh, I asked my friend Stan who, was Stan, who was her friend, I said, Stan, who is she? And and what do you think about her and me? And he said something like, oh, she's way too good for you. <laughs> and he is right. He was right then, he's right now. But there was this conviction in my heart, and I had a whole lot of hesitation because I hate rejection. But I didn't let that stop me from doing a courageous thing for me. I started a conversation, and then she said, yeah, I'll go bowling with you. And we went to the granary, which was this quirky little restaurant in Norfolk, and we had French cheesies, and that's never a bad decision, I'm going to tell you right now. And then there was, you know, courtship and engagement. Got married. I don't know. It just all went boom, boom, boom like that. Crazy. Now, you have to ask Jackie what the Holy Spirit was telling her when I, she said yes to a date. That's a whole other story. She can give that message. But Now, do you think I'm happy today that I didn't ignore the tension in that apartment on 108th and Maple when I was 19? Do you think I'm happy that I, that I followed that? Oh, yeah, every day. And do you think I'm happy that, that I, did, I ignored the tension that was in me not to reach out to that young lady, Jackie, and, and I actually had the courage to do that? Of course I See, here's the thing. 
When you're making decisions, when you're making relationship decisions, when you're making moral decisions, when you're making ethical decisions, when you're making career decisions, it is worth it to listen, to stop, to let it bother you, to wait for something to come out of that. And it might just be God speaking to you, so give it some time and pray and let it bother you and look into the scripture and let me press into you. Because every week here, if you're around here, you know this, we commune together. That's, we, we share the Lord's Supper. Uh, and that's when we just pause and we think about our Jesus, our sacrificial, redemptive, forgiving Savior. And, and it's also a time when we can bring matters before Jesus. We're going to celebrate a God-blessed life when we commune. But we got to do work in that sometimes. Do we sense danger? Is there some danger in your life that's creating tension? Maybe it's a pastime that's turning into a habit that's now affecting your mind and your soul and your relationships. Maybe it is some relationship that flatters you and makes you feel stuff about you that you haven't felt for a while. But if your spouse knew, if your kids knew, if your parents knew, if your small group knew, It'd feel different to you. Maybe it's something financial that just isn't sitting right. I mean, it looks good, but it just doesn't feel good. Maybe it's a temptation that you're drawn to, but now you know God has a different word for you on the matter, and so you have to pause in his word and say, what does he really say about this? Because it's amazing the things that God's word says about things, if we'll read the word. So, Lord, as we commune in in this time, some of us will commune, some will, will pray. May it be a time to ask a question, a simple question. Is there something that will keep me up at night? Lord, reveal it. Give us honesty to look at it, to take the time necessary. It might not be in this moment. It might take us days. But there's something about it, Lord, where you can continue to give answers to those who seek you. So may that begin in this moment for whoever that might apply to. Thank you for Jesus who changed our lives. It's in his name we pray. Amen. I really appreciate you, that, that you'll be here, that you'll come and, and take the risk of hearing God speak to you. Um, when we open his word, there's always the risk that, that uh, we take that... We may hear things we don't like, and we may have to make changes that are hard. Yeah, I'm just being real with you. You know, I, I, I was thinking about this just walking in. This is different than what I was going to say before I walked in. But uh, our conscience is a great thing. But there's also an enemy that likes to warp it and bring guilt into our lives that keeps us from listening to God. And so you can't, you can't take a day like today and say, you know, leave here and say, and, and beat yourself up and say, well, God could never change me. It's too late for me. It's, there's no way I could ever be a different person because I, I know what my past is. I know what's already happened. I already made these mistakes and I live with them every day. Look, those are all just lies that are told to you to keep you from living from this point on in the truth. And so I just want to encourage you to open yourself up, you know, to, the, the prudent see danger and take precaution. The simple ignore the signs and they keep going and suffer the consequences. So don't ignore the tension. You know, let God open something up for you that you and he can work on. Because it's amazing the power of God that he can take a person's life and he can transform it by the renewing of your mind. He'll do that for you if you'll let him. And uh, as a church, we just want to encourage you with that.